And then <clears throat> at one point, her, her, the other security guy was big and buff comes in and says, why are you even helping Palestinian children? Your husband is Iraqi. You should be helping Iraqi children. And I'm a strong person. I mean, yesterday, I can't even tell you what I dealt with at the hospital in terms of a woman who lost her baby, another person with emergencies, all these things. I'm tough, right? We're Palestinians. We're tough. And we can, we can handle a lot. But for some reason, when that guy asked me that question, why, aren't you, why are you helping Palestinian? Why aren't you helping Iraqi children? It almost touched off this sense of guilt. Like, oh, you're right. I should be helping those children. I'm thinking of, of all the other stuff that I've done, somehow this what I, was, was the key question. And I started to cry. <clears throat> and it was really hard for me to sort of regain composure because I knew everything was lost. At a certain point, she says, well, OK, let's just take your phone and look at your contact list. And let's go to your Facebook page. And I said, you know, I am a physician. Thanks so much. And I have me, you know, it's my work phone. I don't think I have patient information, but I certainly have information about my colleagues at the hospital. And I'm like, I don't think so. <clears throat> and, uh, and I said, and why are you asking all this? And she says, well, if you were, you know, your country would do the same thing. This is October. I said, oh, no, they wouldn't. That won't happen in America. So, but that's my point also. Who's teaching whom? Where did we get all these lessons about how to uh, deal with people as they come into this country? Where does it start? That, that's sort of my point. So finally, she says, well, we'll go ahead and put everything through and see what happens. I said, really? Are you, or is there still a chance I could get in? Oh, and the guy, my friend, you know, made me feel bad, says, oh yeah, 50-50. OK. <clears throat> so we waited another three, four hours. Meanwhile, the other people waiting, how many of you have been at the uh, crossing, the Allenby crossing, or crossing from Jordan into to the, uh, Palestine? So a lot of people, and you go, and you come, and you go through the questioning. And eventually, everybody gets through. The tourists go through fast. And then there's these, the rest of us. So it was me, these two young men from Jerusalem, my colleague. It was a, a woman from Gaza who had been, I think, on for medical care with two small children. Eight, nine, ten hours, they made her wait. Why did she have to wait? Why did those guys from Jerusalem have to wait? You know, they come and go all the time. And it's part of the same systematic, like, let's see how far we can beat you down without beating you down. So then you can't really complain, because they were so polite and they were so nice. Oh, it's not an interrogation, it's just an interview. So finally, they call us and they said, oh, I'm really sorry, but you can't come in. Why not? Well, you know, you, because you couldn't, they did that to me back in 2004, and they said, well, no, and you can't come in, and really, you can never come in, so don't even try to come back. And uh, sign this paper that says you understand why, which said I was a security threat, and I was guilty of illegal immigration. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm going to sign that, and I didn't. And then he was trying to be polite. They have sort of the younger, kinder, gentler folks that are trying to, you know, and they have a big mural on the wall of two people shaking hands across the border. You're like, in the meantime, there's still like everybody in a line being treated like animals, like cattle, if you look at checkpoints and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but as soon as he I said I wouldn't sign, the man who was really running the whole operation, who was obviously from the Shin Bet, you can always tell because they wear short sleeve shirts, older guy, he just started shouting. He says, call the police, get them out of here, get your bags, and go back. He, was, he became frustrated and angry, because he doesn't like, I think, this newer, superficial version of let's be polite and professional. He, he liked to just, you know, have the, the, the cover removed. So that was that, and I didn't get to go. And I went back and I visited my relatives in Jordan, who also can never go to Jerusalem, because they don't even have American passports in the first place. And then I felt like, well, what am I complaining about? Thinking about those people stuck and waiting, and not and eventually getting in, but having to go through this every time they want to leave. This is the kind of micro picture of things that happen all the time to help destroy the ability of people to go back and reclaim any stake in Palestine. It's much easier for all of you to go than it is for me. I have issues related to property, to my father's inheritance in Gaza. I cannot resolve it because Gaza now is closed on the Egyptian side. Sinai is a no-go zone. And the, if the border opens, it might open tomorrow, in which case the Egyptian embassy told me, just get your ticket and be ready to go at any moment. And then how would I get out? 
so I'm not sure when I'll get to go again. But I'm just, that's just an example of, of how each group of people in different places ex is part of the same overarching system, which is really to just to, to, to wear us down. Fortunately, though, my two sons who were studying in Jordan got to go to Jerusalem for two days. Luckily, I wasn't with them for their sake. Um, and so to, to, we're still going to try to establish our connection to who we are as Palestinian people. <clears throat> but this fragmentation is imposed by numerous onerous obstacles, whether it's the physical barriers or administrative impediments. Again, kind of hard to pinpoint sometimes. What, what, what's the problem? You just put in your application to get transferred to go get your medical care, like any place else, just like your country. But it's always one step after another. Something doesn't work right, and then you know, it just wears you down. Um, obviously, the violence, ongoing, pervasive, repeated, arrests, detentions, home demolitions, all of that exposure has an impact psychologically on everybody who witnesses it. And then there's the overt military action itself, especially in Gaza. And all of this has an impact on the children <clears throat> and their families. Excuse me. What that leads to is fragmentation and disarray of a healthcare system. They do the best they can, but they really don't have the resources. <clears throat> the lack of clean water supplies, that, that's a whole issue in and of itself that we'll be talking about. And then inadequate wastewater and sewage treatment that affects the water as well and contributes to illness. They don't have electricity all the time, and this is partly related to Israel, but partly related to the conflict between, within the Palestinian Authority itself. <clears throat> Unavailability of necessary supplies and parts. Gaza has been under siege for 10 years now, so there's certain things they can't get because they're dual use and can somehow be used for, for nefarious acts or for terrorism. And, but they may be the part to, uh, 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 you know, an incubator for a neonate that you can't get fixed. <clears throat> there's also this imposed dependence on Israel. When it's interesting, when you go to Gaza, all of the food on the shelves is from Israel. All of the pictures are of like European appearing children in Hebrew, and I'm like, what's happening with the boycott here? But they can't really because they're a dependent population. The same is true for medication, pharmaceuticals, the better quality medication come from Israel. Everybody knows that. But even then, they're usually at a shortage of 20 to 30 <coughs> percent. Then, of course, there's the lack of freedom of movement altogether into and out of the region, into and throughout the West Bank. This affects training, expertise, skills, people, uh, you know, continuing education. There's only so much you can do by, uh, through uh, uh, like a webinar. You know, you have to have hands-on training. If I were going to teach somebody some surgical technique, there's only so much you can do, and that affects the quality of the, like, the medical personnel and staff that you have. You combine that with the dysfunctionality of the Palestinian governing body and its own inability to overcome internal obstacles to render care. There's the absence of a unified Palestinian central administrative control. So you have the overall occupation, the siege of Gaza, then you have this governing body that within that context is supposed to govern. I don't know how possible it is, what's the best possible reality you could have, but the one that exists right now is not good. Um, and then there are cultural realities, especially when you're looking at um, dealing with certain problems, of them, for example, mental health issues, if there's a stigmatization within the culture of accessing mental health services that are at, totally inadequate to start with. This is a huge problem. We have a huge problem with this in this country, so I can't imagine how they can cope with it in Palestine. But at the same time, cultural realities help communities survive and somehow endure this 70 year situation, uh, whether it's because of family cohesion, whether it's because of their strong religious identity as Muslims and Christians, their focus on resilience, and of course the self-awareness of the Palestinian concept of Samud, known as steadfastness, in the face of adversity. That we can get through this, we did it before, we'll do it again, this is who we are, and this is what we do. So as far as the state of children, <clears throat> Over 40% of children in Palestine, people in Palestine are under the age of 14. It's a huge population. The total population is about 4.6 million in the West Bank and Gaza. They have a very high exposure to violence, which obviously results in things like anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder. 
Um, they have problems with access to adequate health care, so a huge number have to get referred outside of the region. And the referral system itself is quite a nightmare. It's a huge burden to the Palestinian Ministry of Health, which pays for them to go. And then there's also the issue of whether they get permission to go, especially if they're trying to leave uh, Gaza. Um, we'll talk later in our uh, uh, workshop or in our panel about some, some more specific issues related to, to health issue health. But suffice to say that the, the circumstances are not good. The indicators that I always look to are infant mortality and child mortality. So infant mortality in Palestine is like 12, between around 15 per 100,000 infants die per 100,000 lives birth. The number for Israel is three. Interestingly, when you look at these statistics, they don't compare the Palestinian territories to Israel. They compare them to Lebanon and Jordan. You're just another Arab thing. So we'll compare you to the Arabs, not to the Israelis, who then see themselves more in a line with Europe and the West. The uh, mortality of children under the age of five is 15 per thousand, and in Israel it's four per thousand. The Millennium Development Goal is to get that number under 14. Um, the maternal mortality rate, the chances of a woman dying in childbirth, is 28 per 100,000. In the United States, it's 13 per 100,000. It's not a good number for us, actually. In Israel, it's six per 100,000. So these are some like big picture indicators that, that there's a bad situation. This is just looking at death rates. We're not even looking at illness. But what contributes to general illness and death, morbidity and mortality, as we refer to it, are <clears throat> things like the hazards of the occupation, violence, imprisonment, incarceration, which we'll also talk about, barriers to care, unemployment as high as it's just depending on what you read, 40 to 80 percent in Gaza, perhaps. That increases the risk of kids having to work and child labor. We talked a little bit about the water supply and the increase of parasitic diseases because of contamination. Overcrowding in schools, as well as overcrowding in homes. Have any of you visited a, a refugee camp or a home in a refugee camp? And I, I apologize, I have some pictures, but they're the same everywhere you go, whether it's in Jordan or Lebanon or Gaza or the West Bank. But it, you'll have eight people living in two rooms, and, and we can talk about the whole what the risks are related to that kind of uh, situation, but it's not, it's not a healthy environment. Um, but like I said, we'll go into more detail uh, when we have our panel discussion. So the efforts to mitigate the effects of the occupation of the West Bank and the siege of Gaza are insufficient at best. I mean, the Israeli government does make some attempts or claims to the Palestinian Authority is responsible, say for example, they have the Ministry of Health, which is functional on some levels, not on others. The international community puts out an effort, whether it's UNRWA or the World Bank, WHO, lots of NGOs are there. All of them have major infrastructure and civil society projects, but they are still impeded by the political realities that change. So even if you work for the WHO, but for some reason today you couldn't get your permit to go into Jordan, or they told you you, you only have a one month permit, so now you have to leave, go back to Jordan to come back, as opposed to a three month permit to stay in the West Bank. All of these little micro obstacles that just make it so that the person says, you know what, I think I'm gonna go work in another country because this is just too much. It's taking its toll. Um, and I think that that, <clears throat> that is deliberate. But ultimately, just to sort of finish up, I, I do want to say that you know, we belong to a community of consciousness. Right? That is why we are here today. We are all here, we see each other at these events, we continue to be there. We continue to stand up for this because we are people of consciousness that believes that all lives matter. Right? We, We don't have tolerance for any notion of comparative suffering. Why are you helping Palestinians when such and such children are suffering more or such and such is a different situation? As a human being who has sort of a moral perspective, that's an irrelevant. It's, all of it matters to me. The question is, what can I do? Where can I be effective? How can I help? Right now, with the way social media is, with the way the news media is, it's so overwhelming, it's easy to say, it's just too big of a problem and I can't do anything. But that's, as people of conscience, as people of morality, 
there's no excuse. And if people who believe in God, you know, when, he, when we're taken to task and are accountable, and we say, you know, God, I'm sorry, I couldn't do anything because it was just too much. And we have this, you know, very uh, privileged lifestyle. So he's elevated us to a certain position. This is a concept expressed in the Quran that you know, bestowed certain gifts on some of you to test you. What are we going to do with what we have for those who don't? And it is hard, and nobody can deny that, but we are still here in spite of the difficulty. As uh, if one child suffers because of conditions that we, as the stewards of God's earth, which is, again, a concept that I have as a Muslim, which, which is what, the, when you hear about Khalifa or the Caliphate, the word Khilafat al-Ard is the vicegerent on earth, the steward. It, forget about all the sort of politics, and that's a different notion altogether. But what it really means is we are the stewards. We're here on God's behalf. And if the, if the child is suffering because of conditions that we as the stewards of God's earth and creation could have prevented, then we are all responsible. Still, we must act. So if we can do something, we must do something. And later on, we will talk about opportunities to make a difference. We have some other speakers that will focus on how we can bring hope. I sort of painted not a very happy picture, but, but there is always hope. Um, I remember the late Edward Said when I was in college at UCLA. Daryl's already revealed how old I am because how long I've been married and I was not a child bride. Um, <clears throat> but I remember asking the question, this is at, uh, he spoke at UCLA when I was an undergrad in the 80s, like how, how bad it was, right? Those were the good old days. And I said, how do you, how do you keep going when the situation is so bad? And he, it was, he was speaking, I was at that back of the room, and as if he were to, to almost like smack me and say, how dare you? He didn't say it like that, but that's how I received it. He was appropriate and polite, but saying, you have to, you can never give up hope. We, we do not have the luxury of that. You must continue. And, it, and I was really struck because I was, what, 1920 and I was already giving up. And he, I think that's probably what upset him to say, how can you say that? You haven't even begun. And, and so I think I've always remembered that because we have to keep looking to the future, being hopeful, things change, things happen. Bill O'Reilly got fired. You know, it's possible. So we have to really believe in those things and to be able to support the intrinsic ability demonstrated by the Palestinians themselves to restore themselves and to regain their ability to survive and ultimately thrive because they can, we can, we have, and that is what people need and what they want and God willing that is what they will do. So thank you so much.